You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me, right. That's like the perfect answer for this. Now, that's what I think every time I walk into a Japanese university or high school classroom and I look at the technology and I say, you gotta be kidding me. Blackboard and chalk, there's no interactive whiteboard. Some of them don't have Wi-Fi. Many of them don't have Wi-Fi. Miles behind the times. I'm looking around the room, and if I am insulting anybody, I'm sorry, but I think absolutely everybody in here is a Generation X person or older. Um, I don't think there are maybe one or two towards the older end of the millennials, maybe. But when we get to the Gen Z people, they're growing up in a very, very different world from us. They are the so-called digital natives, and except for maybe me, in this room, everybody else is an immigrant, and they're all dead geeks. They learn in a different way from us. They process things in a different way from us. They have a much shorter attention span than us. So the presentation I'm going to do today is kind of geared towards the kind of presentation style they expect. They don't want slides full of text. They turn that off. They don't tune into it. They don't want people reading notes to them. They tune that out. They want things in, they don't deal with things in a linear manner. They like iBooks and eBooks and they click on a link and go somewhere else and they come back. In short, they learn in a different way. And there's nothing we can do about it. They're the next generation. You can't put that genie back in the bottle. Yeah. It doesn't work. You can't pretend that it's not there. This is what's coming. If we want to educate them, this is the kind of thing that we have to deal with. They are going to be our next generation of students. If we don't educate them in a way that they expect them to be educating, they'll go somewhere in the world. That's the bottom line. And this is where Japan's getting loads of things wrong. So let's do a quick show of hands. Um, how many people have heard of these things? Toik? Tofu? IELTS? You know them all. This is what Japanese education focuses on. Um, how about these? How many people know about project sales? There's no hands go up. This is the biggest thing in American high school for measuring information literacy. Can students find information and can they work out where it comes from and how relevant it is? And what about ECDL? Anybody know ECDL? Stands for the European Computer Driving License. This is a qualification that they teach people to make sure that their computer skills are up to a certain level. How about my t-shirt? Anybody know what this is? And don't say Chanel, like one of my colleagues last week. I don't wear Chanel. Does anybody know what this is? Close captions. Close captions. <laughs> no, you guess, but completely wrong. Actually, it's Creative Commons. And it's a licensing ah. set of standards. Because most people just think, there's a photo, it's on the internet, I can take it, put it in my slideshow, it's fine. It's not fine. It's stealing. It's digital plagiarism. And it's rife in education in Japan, and it's almost as rife in education everywhere else. It's on the internet, it's mine. That's just like me walking along and saying, hey, it's on the table, it's mine, I'm going to phone my mom in Scotland. It's not my phone, even though it's within my grasp, to take it, it's not mine. So we need to teach students on the internet how they can find images and sources that they can use, and that's what this is, it's a set of six licenses. Lawrence Lessig, you guys probably heard of him, He's one of the main drivers behind this movement. There's six levels of licensing here, and it teaches students you know, what they can and cannot use. And you can even license your own work under this. It's free, it's open source, it's fairly simple. I'm not going to go into it today. Google it, you'll find it. That's how the Generation Z kids learn. Uh, moving on then. What do the good international schools do? There are a number of really, really good, high quality international schools in this region. ASIJ, Yokohama International School, Nishimachi. Every single one of them is on the one-to-one -one program. You guys know what that is? One kid, one device. Um, generally, at elementary school, they've all got an iPad. Junior high and senior high, they've all got the same MacBook Pro I have. Except for Yokohama International School, they're going beyond this. They're planning to be the world's first two-to-one school, where every kid has a tablet and a laptop because they do different things and you need different ones for different times. Every one of them is on Google Institutional Apps for Education. There are only 12 universities in Japan on this plan, and there's hundreds worldwide. And this is what the top schools are doing. And my kids go to a local Japanese school and their technology is about 18 old Windows desktops that are stuck in the library. And the students don't go to the library every period. These kids in these schools, every single classroom is a computer classroom because the whole campus, the whole school is Wi-Fi. And every kid's got a device and every teacher's got one and they've got the same device. My own university. We have Wi-Fi in our university that supports 300 devices. We have 3,000 students. 
guess what happens when 301 people try and use the internet? It crashes. We're not up to speed. Um, these are just some of the things that students learn in my class. These are just some of the things that students are learning at elementary, junior high, and senior high school. Some of you will know some of these icons. One or two of you might know all of them. Some of you might not even know any. The Generation Z kids and millennials, this is where they live. This is what they deal with. This is what they're using all the time if they're going to a good school. You want to reach these kids? Don't make up like a walled garden Moodle blackboard web TV crap that the kids don't go to. You want to reach them, go to Facebook, go to Twitter, go to LinkedIn, go to Google Plus. That's where they are, that's where they live. Now, Japanese education, as I see it, is very much ooh, you some moving. Come on, move. Um, like this. That's the idea of a tablet. <laughs> Rather than this kind of tablet. And it's very limited. And this is because the way that they're viewing education, they think education is for memorization, and it's not. That's what memory sticks are for, the two as it says, memory stick. You know, education really should be about exploration, learning new things, new ideas. So to save their blushes, I won't mention the university's name, but needless to say, it's one of the two big private universities in Tokyo. It's huge, it's famous, it's very well known. And I got invited to an educational technology ZEMI class with the master's and doctor students, educational technology. And they told us in advance that they were going to be reading and discussing this paper. I thought, great. I downloaded it, put the PDF on my iPad, I annotated it, I'm ready, ready to rock and roll. And I walk into the room, and everybody going into the room has been given a paper printout copy of the paper, like forget the trees, yeah? And they've printed out 25 copies of these. And I'm like, I don't need one. No, tick, tick, I don't need. And I went into the room, and the kid who was, well, kid, he's 30 something, I'll give you a quote my age, and this is the guy who's supposed to be presenting on this paper, stood and for 35 minutes read this paper. <laughs> what a waste of my time. You know, the idea we're supposed to be discussing, you tell us in advance, we read it in advance and we turn up. And most of the other people hadn't read it because they were relying on getting these printouts. And this room had no Wi-Fi. Luckily my tablet was a 4G one. There was no LAN cable, there was no projector, there was no screen, there was nothing. And this was an educational technology semi in one of Japan's best universities. Other universities, some of them don't have any Wi-Fi on campus at all. They really are stuck in the past. They don't get it. Now, that kind of thing was okay, as long as you were only concerned with the content. And this was a very old style teaching. Content is king. If you know it, you can teach it. End of story. Except some teachers are very boring teachers. So therefore, pedagogy was needed to kind of make the teaching a little bit more interesting. And pedagogy came along and content had to adjust. And that stayed that way for a long time. Some teachers had a grasp of pedagogy slightly better than others. Educational technology is the game changer. This has totally moved everything. Now things are possible that were never possible before. Um, how many people have heard of flip, flip, flipped learning? Just in time teaching? Expanded classroom? A lot of hands not going up. Imagine I've got a video and I want the students to watch the video. I would have to make 25 copies of that video. The quality is going to go down. A load of money buying VCR cassettes, forget it. Never going to happen. You would put the video in a video player down here, and you would force the students to watch it in the classroom. What if they need the toilet? They either go and miss part of it, or you pause it and make everybody wait. The chairs are not comfortable. Maybe no air con. Certainly no beer. They could get sleeping. <laughs> but if you could allow them to watch it at home, they could be on a nice comfy beanbag, pizza, beer, pause it whenever they like. But how to get that to them? Well, in the modern world, we just rip a digital copy, or upload it to Google Drive or Dropbox, tell them to walk it, watch it at home, and they can come back into class later. And we've not wasted any class time, which is limited on watching this. We've flipped that out to they do it at home. And the just-in-time teaching, you would set them a blog to write on it for homework, and you as a teacher going into, to, into school, you can check the blog on your tablet, read it, make corrective comments to their blog, and all that stuff's done before you've even hit the classroom. That's what 21st century learning looks like. And these guys, um, Mishra and Kohler, they talk about this in their TPAC methodology, which is the blend of content, pedagogy, technology, and so on. Um, I'm not even going to try and pronounce his name. It's some weird Portuguese thing with too many vowels that I can't pronounce. But this guy, Portuguese-American guy, invented this model called the SAMR model. Anyone heard of it? This is how you decide whether the technology is worth adopting or not. And you run through a series of checks. If the technology only substitutes 
for an analog equivalent, you don't make the change. So for example, we look at Google Maps, and we look at an atlas of these maps on the wall. If Google Maps just had maps, and it was only substituting digital for paper, there'd be no need to adopt it. But Google Maps also does the next stage, which is augmentation, which means improving. Now, looking at the map, if I want to see the distance from Australia to Africa, I need a ruler. I need a, another piece of equipment. With Google Apps, you don't. You can just put the pins on Google Maps and you can work it out. So that would be augmentation. But you can actually modify the task. Instead of telling the students to measure the distance between two things, you can actually put pins on the Google Map and you can attach videos and photos to it to make an interactive map. So you're modifying the task. And best of all, you can actually redefine the task. You can go into Google Street View and have the students walking around in the streets of these places and then writing a report on the style of architecture that they saw. So therefore, Google Maps would check every one of the SAMR categories. So you would say, yeah, Google Maps is worthwhile adopting. It doesn't just copy a paper map. So this is one other kind of digital pedagogy going on. Um, we mentioned these things before, expanded classroom a little bit. Learning takes place everywhere, not just when they're inside these four walls, especially if you flip things out and we use the just-in-time teaching, which I mentioned. So for students to take advantage of this, they really, really need to get information. And fortunately, the information is on the internet. It's a big information highway out there. So the problem is, when they go looking for information, they get this. Wow. <gasps> Blah. And a big information overload comes and the system crashes because the students don't know. Deer in the headlights, where do they get the information? Who do they trust? How do they measure it? There's too much. So one of the things that modern 21st century learning has to teach them is how to manage that information. Now that doesn't mean get a cute girl to help you, uh, although that would be very nice. Um, what it does mean is we teach them some strategies for how to manage the information, how to evaluate. If you go on a Wikipedia page, how many people know that Wikipedia actually rates their own pages with a grading system? So you can tell the quality of a wiki page. That stuff's there. These kids know this, or they expect to be told this kind of thing, and classes in education that isn't teaching them this is being deficient. So how does all of this work? Well, for a start, we have to teach the students how to search for information, you know, using Boolean operators, what databases that they're going to look at. We also have to teach them how to capture that information or else they have to keep performing the search again and again and again. So we've got to teach them information capture strategies and most importantly, storage. We don't want them just dropping everything on the desktop of their computer. We want them to make folders. We want them to be online, connected and synced to multiple devices. And that's what they expect as well and we expect them to be able to share the information. Now the sharing is key, and for Japanese students, they don't really get this because their whole life is like, I'm studying for an exam, it's my information, don't look. They don't get the sharing aspect. And that's the hardest sell. Now, if we look at this photo here, how many people can see the holes? How many people can see the bumps? Those of you who saw the hole might not have noticed there was a bump. Those of you who saw the bump might not have noticed there was a hole, but if two of you get together, it's a bump, it's a hole. Oh, really? <laughs> Learning has taken place. You've learned someone else's perspective by sharing and collaborating, and technology makes that stuff easy. Not using the technology, a little bit difficult to get someone on the phone half a world away, but asynchronous learning or online chat, Google Hangouts, Skype video makes this a snap. And all of this adds a real depth and richness to their learning because they're getting all these different perspectives from people all around the place. And obviously that brings in the teamwork aspect. And teamwork is something that they really need to learn when they work or graduate school. And that brings in collaborative production that they can make things. And my students make websites, they make videos, they upload it, and at the end of their course, they don't have a memory of standing here doing a presentation. They've got videos of the presentation, they've got videos of the slideshow, they've got a thematically designed website, they've got their linked essays all uploaded up there, and they're working making these things as a team. Because this is what they call the four C's. And this is what 21st century learning is about. The students basically using the technology, they can connect to anybody anywhere, they can communicate with them, collaborate, work together, and most importantly is they can create. So what this happens in our projects that we're doing in my kind of classes is we take the student's basic idea. It's like a little acorn of an idea. 
and I give them some feedback on this idea. And then they go away and they write a rough paper and make a simple presentation. Then they get collaborative feedback from their friends. They're peer reviewing the slideshow, peer reviewing the paper. They further improve it. Then they put it online and they, they make it into the website. Then they deliver it live. They get more feedback. And at the end of it, they've got this huge big oak that's kind of came out of this little tiny acorn of an idea. And they've got something that's longer lasting rather than just the memory because the paper's online and people can comment it from all around the world. So the slideshow, all this kind of stuff. And it's a very dynamic, very diverse learning environment. And the best way to kind of show a model of this, and again, this is how they learn, they like models. So this book, has anyone read it? One Cubic Foot? Anyone know the book? Really interesting book. This guy went all around the world and he took this framework of a one cubic foot framework and he left it somewhere for 24 hours, came back, closed it off, and then photographed everything that was inside. So for example, um, here's the cube that he put in Costa Rica in the rainforest. And 24 hours later he came back and this was the wildlife that was inside. Then he did the same thing in South Africa, went to Cape Town, put the cube out there, there's what was inside. He went to Iowa, and there's what was inside. <laughs> Iowa had almost nothing, there was no biodiversity there, there was one type of crop, there was loads of chemicals to kill everything else that was there. That's Japanese education, it's not diverse. <laughs> it is not diverse in the slightest. Every single person in the class is Japanese, they went to the same school, the same wherever, there is no biodiversity. But this class did. And this was a class I was teaching at ICU. Every single one of these kids had spent more than a year in abroad in some school. Many of them, many, many different schools. This is their biodiversity. This is the countries that all of these kids collectively together have studied in. And it's a big list of countries. There's about 25 countries there. There's only 22 kids. And every one of these countries, one of those kids at least, sometimes more than one, has spent at least a year in that country studying under that system. So their educational experiences are very dynamic, very diverse, very rich, in a way that's not in Japan. Now, you, guys, you mentioned about the Global 30 in Japan trying to attract international students. Many of these kids are already here. They're at international schools in Japan, and already they're already acclimatized, they're living here. They graduate. Don't go to Japanese universities because the technology at the university is lower than their elementary school. <laughs> Who's going to go to a uni that's got lower tech than your elementary school? Not these kids. Not most of them. They all choose to go where they can continue to learn the tech stuff. Now, just to give you an idea of the kind of projects we were doing, and how many of you have seen the Apple video, The Crazy Ones? Here's to the crazy ones. Um, the Misfits. The Rebels. Very famous act. You can think different. They took all these really old clips and they got a famous actor to read it, spice it all together, blah, 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 blah. blah. I'm running out of time, so I won't play you the whole thing. But my class, the kids that you just saw, was called ARW1. And this was called The Crazy Ones. So I decided to make a video for them called The Crazy ARW Ones. And I videoed all these kids. And I deliberately put their faces Here's to match the up to the words being spoken. The misfits. She was a misfit. She wasn't even supposed to be in the class. The troublemakers. He said it was a troublemaker. Round pegs in the square holes. And I aged the film and I slowed it down to make it look like the old one. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You could quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things they push the human race forward while some may see them as the crazy ones we see genius Einstein with the tongue out genius because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones and they loved that class, so what they did at the end is a surprise for me. They all made sweatshirts that said Patterson's children on it, and they wore them to class one day, which gave me the idea to make the video to say thanks to them. Patterson children. And this is what engages them if they've got that kind of learning. So, very last slide that I'm done. Um, this is what I say we need to teach. And teach stands for technology, education, academia, creativity, and here. 
That's what you need in education. That's what's really lacking from Japanese education. That stuff just isn't there. And just as a last bit of digital pedagogy, what everybody should be doing but didn't um, is you should have a credit slide telling people every single image and piece of music that you've used <laughs> in your slide where you got it from. And if you don't have one of those, you're a plagiarist. Now, lucky for you guys, I couldn't see your slides. I don't know if you had it, so I won't deserve judgment. But I was actually sitting there and I couldn't see it. But this is what you've got to teach kids to be digitally literate. We teach them not to copy from books and steal. They shouldn't steal images and multimedia stuff from the internet. And with that stuff, I'd suggest I'm, I'm you need finished. to teach the teachers first. Well, wow, there you go, yeah. My own teachers, I've, I've seen their, they're uploading DVDs from a book onto their website to show to the students, and I'm like, don't even go there. But they did, and yeah, so you're right, teachers need to learn this first. I um, include myself. <laughs> anyway, Lego pictures. Any questions?